Okay, now that we've set up the composition notebook, you're going to go through the presentation with me on this recording, and you will copy down the notes that I give you that are the answers to the questions. You will do this in your composition notebook on the right hand side under the headline where it says notes. So let's get started. As you can see by the scary music in the background, this is going to be about a brief history of witches. The girl featured in this picture is actually an artist's rendering of Abigail, the main character in The Crucible, so you can kind of see from the details included with her uh, what kind of character you think she may actually play. Our love affair with witches actually began way before the Wizard of Oz. In fact, we first learn of witches from the mentioning in the Bible in 560 BC. So before Jesus actually roamed the earth, we learned about witches from scripture. There are two different places within the Bible that mention witches and instruct people what to do when encountering a witch. In Exodus, it actually says, Thou shall not suffer a witch to live. This basically means, if you see a witch, your duty as a Christian is to kill it. No witches should be allowed to live. Then in Leviticus, it gets a little more detailed when it says, A man or a woman that has a familiar spirit or that is known to be a wizard shall surely be put to death. In fact, they shall stone them with stones, their blood shall be upon them. So it gives more direct instruction in that we should stone witches should we come across them. If the Bible says it, then it must be true. This was the way of the world. You're talking about people who didn't have a lot of learned book education. They were farmers and peasants, lay people. By the Bible instructed them on how to live their life. They took it literally, not symbolically. They didn't interpret it. If the Bible said that there were witches and that we should kill witches, then it must be true. So there you have it. We first learn of the notion of witches and how to handle them in the Bible. As we go back to our timeline here, we'll skip ahead to 420 AD. Oh, just as everyone was getting used to the idea of witches, St. Augustine came around and said that, no, witches don't in exist. Only God has divine power. Only God has the kind of power to control people and emotions. So if you believe that there are witches, you're actually blasphemous because only God can have that kind of power. And you are equating a witch as someone who has almost as much power as God. So St. Augustine comes around, rains on everyone's stoning parade, and says, no, witches do not exist. Heading back to the timeline, fast forwarding even more to 1208. So in the 1200s, this guy over here, Pope Innocent III, doesn't like the fact that there's a group of religious separatists named the Cathars. Sorry for that. The Cathars actually begin to believe that there's God and the devil and that they're in this battle with one another for people and their souls and tempting them. Pope Innocent is worried that the Cathars are stirring up too much trouble because they're not adhering to what Catholics say should be the word. In this depiction here, you see a woman trying to avoid Satan. You notice that Satan has a goat's head. He is, has claws on his feet, and he has his butt turned to the woman. That's because people who worship the devil were actually believed to have literally kissed the butt of Satan. It's because of this Catholic Pope, Pope Innocent III, that Satan moved from just being a mischievous little devil who liked to play pranks on people to actually this notion of Satan. The evil Satan that we know today.
Because of Pope Innocent putting out all this propaganda of the Cathars worshipping the devil, people started to see Satan as evil, not just as someone who liked to play tricks on people. A little later on in the 13th century, we move on to 1273. This guy, St. Thomas Aquinas, he was trying to make a case of God existing. Therefore, he says that demons, or the devil, and witches work together to try and lead people into sexual temptation. He states that women are having sex with demons, that the demons are running around and actually harvesting sperm of men and uh, implanting it in women, making them pregnant with demon children, and that only through God can we avoid these people. So because of St. Thomas Aquinas, the Catholic Pope, he says that the devil and witches are actually working together and that they are working together to lead people into sexual temptation. So then we move ahead to the 1400s. The 1400s were a very dark time for people who were considered to be witches. In fact, here's a picture of people who were known to be sycophants for the devil. You notice how the devil changed shape a little bit. Still has the goat heads with the horns, but now he has wings, more claw-like hands. He has a tail, but yet people are still worshipping him, and you notice that the lady is on her knees, literally kissing Satan's butt. This picture depicts what happened to people who said they who were supposed to be witches. The punishment for being a witch at this time was being hanged or burned at the stake. In the final picture here, you see people bringing offerings to the devil. They have voodoo puppets, Satan has a new tail, he looks a little more sinister, birds are around. Um, it's Satan controlling people and people who are thought to be witches. So the 1400s were not a good time for people to be accused of being a witch. In 1484, it is the witch police. This pope over here, Pope Innocent VIII, no relation to the first Pope Innocent, Pope Innocent VIII is worried that too many people are trying to leave Catholicism or the Catholic Church. So he has two priests write Malleus Maleficarum over here. It was this document that actually outlined how to spot a witch. Malleus Maleficarum actually means hammer of witches. So the Malleus Maleficarum is what gave us this notion of understanding that um, witches, to, in order to spot a witch, you had to strip them of all their clothes, shave the hair from their body, and see if they had any birthmarks or moles. If they did, then they were most likely a witch because they had been marked by the devil. So birthmarks and moles of any kind were known as devil's marks. It also instructed judges how to deal with witches. This is where we found out that if we poke those moles or those birthmarks, if there was pain or it bled, then that was a natural mark. If it didn't, if there was no pain, then that meant it was unnatural and the devil caused it. It's also where we got the idea of dunking witches in the water. If they floated, if they could float in the water, then they were had been with the devil and were most definitely witches. If they sunk, not only were they dead, but it was proven that they were actually innocent. So in no way was it a good situation to be in. But because of this Catholic Pope, Pope Innocent VIII, he produced Malleus Maleficarum in order to keep people from leaving the Catholic Church. It was his way of trying to retain his people in his church and not break off into a separatist Christian organization. Then we move on to the 1500s. In the 1500s, um, it was a horrible time in European history. Many, many people lost their lives. In fact, in Geneva, Switzerland, 500 women were burned at the stake. In Lake Como, Italy, a, si a town that is actually smaller than the size of Gardner had 1,000 executions. 
In Germany, 26,000 were executed. In France, 10,000. In England, 1,000. It's said that there were anywhere from 60 to 80,000 people executed, and 80% of those people executed were women. Women were more susceptible. They were thought of as a second-class citizen. They weren't as intelligent as men in the eyes of these people, so therefore they were more susceptible to um, lying with the devil. So as you can see by the numbers, 80,000 people, 80% 80 women, lost their lives because they were accused of being witches, all in the 1500s. In 1591, King James came, and he was supposed to marry Anne of Norway. But however, when they were trying to meet one another, their ships kept encountering these major storms. Some shipmen lost their lives. Six Danish women said that they were the ones who caused the storms because they were witches. And this is the point when King James begins to take witchcraft as a serious crime. In 1606, Shakespeare wrote the play Macbeth, which actually uh, had cast some witches. And this is where we get the modern idea of witches as hags and old women with large noses standing over a cauldron that's boiling uh, with strange ingredients. So it's because of Shakespeare that we have what we think of as a modern day witch image. In the 1640s, it was the largest French witch hunt. In a town the size of Gardner, in one year alone, 650 people were arrested for witchcraft. And in 1682, England executed its last witch. But it was at this time that the Puritans were starting to leave England and come to America. And that's why in 10 years later, in 1692, we had the Salem Witch Trials. So if we take a look back at our timeline, you can see that the witch hunt goes all the way until 1692. We tend to still have witch hunts today sometimes. We just don't literally call people witches, but we blame things on certain people. But what I want you to do is take this information and think about if these people were being raised with all this activity in Europe and then coming to America, what ideals were they bringing to America? What thoughts were they bringing to America? And how did that affect them in their new world? So what you're going to do now is in your composition notebook draft a 200 word response. It's a minimum of 200. If you go over of 200 words, it's a minimum. If you go over that, that is completely fine. But you're answering how would this history affect the way the new people in America thought? Would they believe that there are witches? Do they know how to get rid of witches? These are the question, this is the question that you are trying to answer. Please let me know if you have any questions.